everybody to the lecture titled ODFS Waveform. This is, this is part of a series of lectures on 5G technologies. And in today's lecture, we will be talking about the main concept of OTFS waveform, which is different from the regular waveforms we discussed about before, like o OFDM and other waveforms based on OFDM, like filter OFDM, Windowed OFDM, Universal Filtered OFDM, Generalized Frequency Division Multiplexing, and uh, other schemes as well, as well as the single carrier waveforms like DFT Spread OFDM, Zero Tail DFT Spread OFDM, and Unique Word DFT Spread OFDM, which you are familiar with most of these types of waveforms. Now, in this lecture, the main talk is going to be about a different concept and we will understand the need for this new concept and its key differences from the previous ones. So we we'll basically understand the transmitter structure, the receiver structure, the different types of bit design and its relationship with the channel and how is the channel definition and assumption is different from the previous assumptions and how is it more general than the previous one and it can cover all the use cases and scenarios and after that we will explain the key benefits and advantages that this new modulation scheme brings to the community but before we start with the OTFS explanation and concept definition let's go back in time a little bit and explain the key motive the previous generations related to wireless systems. So we started from 2G that, that was launched around 1990s and the key application at that generation was basically voice. Uh, and, as, and for voice to transmit it wirelessly, we came up with the with the concept called TDMA, Time Division Multiple Access Scheme, which, can, which works like a modulation scheme that's capable of meeting the requirements of transmitting your voice wirelessly. Then after 2G, we had new set of requirements that are not only, not only intending to serve voice, but also the data coming from different applications connected with the internet. So therefore, TDMA was lacking behind us and was deemed unsuitable modulation to meet up with the requirements of the new use cases. Therefore, TDMA was proposed and was adopted as the new modulation scheme to fit and be uh, candidate scheme to meet the requirements in 3G and the uh, period gap between 2G and 3G was around 10 years after 10 years more from 3G we came up to 4G and in 4G there was the the demand on data and the high speed internet continued to rise year, year after year of course, due to the emergence of a new set of applications, uh, like everything right now is connected to the internet. Even your desktop applications are now being transferred transferred to the cloud so that you can access them from anywhere because of the easiness of doing that and the comfort that it brings to its customers. So not only the applications, but only the mobile, uh, the mobile devices. Now you have smartphones that, that almost function like a computer in your pocket. So this was not available previously. And therefore, we have something that's really, really different today. That, that's really completely different and dissimilar from the previous schemes. Now, with the, emerge, with the 5G technology, we told you that the technology, the applications are there. There are thousands of different use cases and applications that, can, that, uh, that are emerging and require robust technology to meet its requirements. But unfortunately, 
the technology is missing. There is no technology that can simultaneously at one time meet the requirements of all these use cases and applications and services, including, as we explained in the previous lecture, including enhanced mobile broadband, ultra-reliable low-latency communication, vehicular-to-vehicular -vehicular communication, massive machine-type communication, which is massive Internet of Things sometimes is called, and many, many, many other applications. So 5G was, and is, it's really completely different than the previous generations in the sense that it's not focusing only on one use case. And therefore, it's really difficult to say that there is one single unique solution that can fit all these requirements. Although OTFS is proposed in order to meet some of these requirements, but we will see how is how it is lacking some of the lacking in some aspects and cannot meet all the requirements of the applications simultaneously. So now, where does where do we look for the optimal five G waveform and why five G waveform is important to be defined? There are millions of dollars being spent just on coming up with a robust, resilient waveform that can be used to transmit our data through the channels. So for TDM, the waveform was something like you have a pulse, pulse and time domain, as you can see here with me, pulse and time domain, and you have consecutive pulses carrying QAM data symbols and transmitting them through the channel. So that was, that was an optimal for the case of voice communication maybe at that generation, but it's not any more optimal for the current wireless communication systems. Uh, for OFDM, it uses like tones. So this is, this is in time domain. It's, as you can, it's sine signal, sinusoidal signal. In frequency domain, it's sync. So we call it tone here in the time domain. And the key advantage of OFDM that it brings over TDM A is the ability to, to make it robust against time dispersive channel and having easy equalization in the frequency domain for the first time. Instead of doing the equalization in time domain, we are doing it in the frequency domain. And no matter what the channel delay spread is, you, at the end of the day, it just you just add a CB and you make your... Uh, equalization and process easy. For, CD, for CDMA, it was spread spectrum. You assign for each user a unique code, and these codes are orthogonal to each other, and you assign and locate the whole band with one cell. However, there is a limitation in terms of number of codes that you can transmit, and the equalization process a little bit at the receiver complex and you need to use rack receivers and combine all the multipaths that are being received at different racks and this is not uh, a convenient way to do your communication that's why as you can see each one each one of these each one of these modulation schemes has its advantages and disadvantages so the goal of OTFS is trying to bring the advantages of all these schemes together and to try to minimize their disadvantages as much as we can. So again, just to wrap up this one more time, TDMA was good for voice communication, but the problem with TDMA, it, it was not good for... A, equalization when you have equ equalization in time domain is really really headache and complex and sophisticated so it might work in a doubler environment but when you have a extremely time dispersive channel then you end up having too much complexity at the receiver side which is not good this is the drawback for OFDM the drawback peak to average power ratio and out of band emission and synchronization problem in the case of doubler it's very sensitive to doubler in the case of cdm a 
It's true that it's resilient to interference because your signal, before you transmit it, it looks like this. When you transmit it, it becomes below the noise and below the interference, and at the receiver, you just multiply by the code and get your signal back. But there is limitation in terms of the number of orthogonal codes that you can assign, and eventually you run out of codes and your system capacity saturates to certain limit. So basically, this was the idea. The idea is that the goal is to mix, try to bring the advantage of this, the advantage of this, the advantage of this in one waveform and reduce the disadvantages as much as we can. So, but what's the, what's the mathematical foundation that OTFS stands over it? So before we start with OTFS and the explanation and concept and how it's used as a waveform for wireless communication transmission, let's give a basic overview about something called representation theory in mathematics. So representation theory in mathematics, it's, it's all about studying the symmetry of the shapes, the symmetry of the function, how, and how robust they are against the variations and rotations and uh, operations on them. For example, to give you a simple example, let's let's say we have uh, we have a sphere here, and we want to see how much this sphere is robust to rotations. So and. So, for example, you rotate, you rotate it left, you rotate it right, you rotate it from up, you rotate it from down. At the end of the day, it remains a sphere, yes? So, we call, we say that the sphere is invariant to the number of rotation and the way you, re you rotate it. No matter, no matter which way you rotate or what method you use, at the end of the day, it remains a sphere. So, we call this rotation invariant it doesn't change it's it's symmetric shape it doesn't change with rotation now on the other side let's talk about another shape that's not symmetric let's say uh, this chicken here so basically when you rotate it the shape becomes different it's no longer the same shape the, the same as the original shape. So we call this shape, it's dependent on the rotation. The, it depends on the way you rotate it. When you rotate it in a certain way, the shape changes. So we say it's rotation dependent. It, there is no symmetry on this shape. The symmetry is low. Uh, this concept is very general, very general, the symmetry and the representation theory. And we just here gave an example in terms of geometry. Now, in when you come to the communication, what do we have? We don't have spheres and we don't have chickens and this. We have waveforms. We have signals that we are transmitting over the air. And th these signals, when you transmit it over the air, it interacts with the environment. It hits the home, gets reflected of it. It hits the building, it hits the trees, gets reflected. It. it hits cars, trees. It hits thousands of objects and get reflected of these all objects and reach the receivers. So now, now, by the time it reaches the receiver, what do you think the shape of the signal will be? You transmit it this, man this way. It was... So a very nice, cute sinusoidal signal. By the time it reaches the receiver, it becomes missing. It becomes unrecognizable. You cannot even you cannot even imagine that this was a sign. Oh, and now you got a completely different signal from the one you transmitted. Now, what's your job at the receiver? It tried to recognize that this was a sign. The receiver will do complex processing, equalization, decoding, uh, channel estimation, in order just to guess that this was a sign carrying this information and decodes it back to its original data and its headache process. So the goal it now, now having understand that, the goal now is to find a waveform 
that if you transmit it over the air, no matter what the channel will cause to the waveform, the waveform at the end of the day will reach in the same shape. Is that possible? Is that ever possible? This is the motivation. This is the main, this is the main research question that was posed long time ago to address this problem and to come up with a new waveform called OTFS. Because currently, when you transmit your waveform, you really struggle at the receiver until you are able to recognize it. So now, now we are mapping math to communication, and we are understanding the problem that we are trying to solve. So when you when you have uh, a hypothesis like this, what do you do? You, we are saying like we need to find a waveform that's symmetric enough and you send it from the transmitter no matter what operation the channel causes to the waveform the waveform at the receiver will be easily detected and recognized as a sinusoidal signal let's say so when you have such a hypothesis what do you do first you start guessing you start saying what if we use this? What if we use that? Can you check whether it works or not? Let it uh, enter to your system and check it whether you can still recognize it or not. So the first guess that the researchers made is to consider a tone, which is like of OFDM. When you transmit a tone, you send it through the channel. But when you consider Doppler and the spread and multi-reflecting objects, you realize that it's not the optimal signal, not the optimal waveform, because there are cases when you have lots of doublers in your channel, you will not be able to recognize your signal anymore. And that's not good. Then this means that a tone signal, which is used in OFDM, cannot be the symmetric waveform so we cancel it the second guess is to say pulse pulse like tdma you transmit a pulse you think it's awesome it's cute and nice it's gonna carry our data it just hit a couple of objects the channel operates on it and you receive it at the receiver you cannot recognize it again so you realize again that this is not the optimal choice as well this is not the optimal choice. So what else then? When you are running, when you run out of choices, out of guesses, what do you do? What do you do when you run out of guesses? You start thinking deeply. And how do you think? You think in terms of math. You just build the equation, put them aside, put them on a paper, write them, and develop, let the theory teaches you the answer just by writing the equation solving them uh, the solution will be the answer and there you will get the answer instead of keep, keep guessing 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 so after developing the theory and solving the equations and obtaining the answer cerebrizingly the waveforms the optimal waveforms that can be some that's robust against the variation of the channel and will be easily recognizable by the receiver regardless of the number of operations the channel operates on it is called is basically a train of pulses modulated by a tone it's not one tone it's not one pulse it's train of pulses train of pulses modulated by a tone so it's basically combination of OFDM, combination of TDM, and combination of CDMA because there is kind of repetition on a certain code with different phases. These pulses with different, they have different phases. So you end up having like a, a code sequence within it. So it basically combines the characteristics of the three fundamental waveforms that were proposed in the previous generation, 2G, 3G, and uh, 4G. It has the characteristic of OFDM. As you can see, globally, it acts, it behaves like a tone. Locally, it behaves as a pulse. And globally, it behaves like a CDMA. 
So this is the optimal waveform that can really make your communication as it was claimed robust against the channel variations. And let's see how does this work. So this is how the think of OTFS the sphere in the representation theory example that I gave to you. You transmit it from the channel, no matter what operation these different uh, objects in the channel cause to the sphere, at the end of the day, the sphere remains the same. Instead of sphere now, we don't transmit a sphere usually, we transmit waveforms. So the waveform, again, this waveform that we transmit, after we can easily identify it at the receiver and recognize that this was the transmitted waveform without much hassle and struggle. So we say that we say that the waveform is oblivious to the channel condition. Means it doesn't it doesn't get affected by the channel condition. The waveform remains unchanged under arbitrary channel condition. Performance, consistency, and robustness. This is the goal. This is the ultimate. This is why we are building waveforms. Waveforms basically physical signal that can determine the shape, location, and duration and bandwidth of your pulse. The goal of this pulse is to make it robust against the channel variation. You can easily detect it at the receiver and also robust against hardware impairments if you have any. So this is the responsibility of a waveform. This is not a responsibility of modulation, changing the properties of the carrier according to the incoming information in order to send additional data bits. It's not like that. Waveforms and modulation as are different and waveform deals with with producing signals physical signals that can carry your data and be transmitted from the transmitter to the receiver while being minimally affected by the impairments caused by the channel or the hardware at the transmitter or receiver so basically you try to have a waveform that has that doesn't have too much peak to average power ratio or too much out of band emission or gets affected by the sensitive to the channel operation. No, you want it to be robust, resilient. You can still get it back at the receiver and detect it easily. This gives us performance consistency and resilience and robustness to the channel imperfections. Because as you know from the wireless communication course for those of you who took wireless communication, the, the first thing we did in the course was to study the channel because we said the channel affects your signal and we need to understand the, the, the behavior, the, the effects of the channel on your signal so that you know ahead of the time how to design your signal in such a way you make it robust against these channel variations or channel characteristics. So this is a waveform. Now, this is the OTFS waveform. Think, think of it. It's, um, it's in a plane, residing in a plane, and the pulse, the pulse, this, this is not 1D. This is 2, two the pulse is coming out as a cab, coming out of the plane in this dimension, Z dimension. You know, uh, electromagnetics? It's in Z dimension. So basically, Think of it as pulse that has two dimension, two dimension, not time and the frequency. They are not time and the frequency. Two dimension in another domain. We call them delay and doubler. Now we'll talk about them in a few minutes. And the pulse energy, the pulse power is coming out of that dimension. So think of it if you want to draw it in a board on the wall. Think the width and length are the dimension of the pulse residing and uh, the the pulse power is coming out of the uh, board or out of the wall, something like this. I believe you can visualize it here, although it's not drawn very well, but I believe you, you got me. It, basically, it's different from this waveform that's 2D. And this waveform that's also 2D. Now, wait, this... This time representation and this frequency representation. How do you go from time to frequency? Fourier transform. 
From time to frequency, you just take the Fourier transform, you go to the frequency. From frequency to time, you get the inverse Fourier transform, and that's it. So this is what we know up until now in signal and system. True? Signal and system, and in all the other courses that we have studied, that we have, we only deal with signals that are either in time or frequency. Take it from this domain to that domain to do some operations that are not possible in the other domain or to make our life easier in the other domain. But where is, if we have only these two domains up until now, where does, where does this domain fit in? We don't, uh, yes, I want to answer this. Where does this domain fit in within the context of signal and system? This, you have to think of it as another new domain. Yes, you cannot call it time, you cannot call it frequency. However, you can move, transfer your signal from this domain to this domain by integrating the function, this function, over a certain variable. Let's say, let's simplify it like this. And you can move from here to there by integrating over certain variable. So it means that this domain has, has a link with this domain, has a link with time, has a link with the frequency, and by its own stands as a different domain. So there is a relationship between all these domains and they are transferable by certain set of mathematical tools, transfer functions, we call them. And we will explain how this is possible. But before that, before that, as let's have a look at something we already have in the literature and we usually deal with, but we never applied it or mapped it to waveform design. This thing is the channel, yes? The channel, the channel, one, one representation, one type of representation of the channel is to represent it kind of, this is your channel. You represent a type of, like, signal that varies over time. Yes, you have time. And the way we define the channel, we define it H tau. T, so you have this signal at T, let's say 1, at T2 you have a little bit different signal, you have H tau T2 and you, you continue. So this is one way of representing the channel. This is the conventional way of representing the channel in communication system. We, by function called uh, uh, channel impulse response. We call this channel impulse response, tau t. At different times, you get different channels. Why? Because the channel changes with the time. Change, at different times, you experience different channel behaviors, and tau represents the delay of the channel. So now, let's let's explore another representation of the channel that's much nicer than the previous representation this representation we call it delay doppler spread representation you have only two parameters delay and doppler tau and v at at each for each reflector in your channel yes you might have trees you might have cars you might have whatever at any cluster of these reflectors, when the channel hits with it and gets reflected, this reflector causes two things, time shift and delay shift. So it, it basically, in other words, it causes certain delay and certain doubler, delay based on the distance and doubler based on the speed. So every column here, every, every column coming out of the plane here, every tuck here, it represents kind of reflector with certain speed and certain distance from the receiver. 
So imagine you are representing the geometry of your channel now. The geometry, if I give you this shape, you tell me, you start thinking. You tell me there is something static here with this distance far from me. There is something moving with this speed and this distance from me. As if you are a radar now. As if you are a radar. So this representation, as you can see, uses 3D. 3D representation. It's kind of 3D representation, isn't it? You have the delay, Doppler, and you have this, the power of your signal in the third dimension. So we are already using this for the channel. Why don't we use it for the waveform? If, if it's applicable to the channel, why don't we apply it to the waveform and de define our waveforms in 3D domain so that it can couple with the channel in a nicer way. You start understanding how the channel acts and behaves and affects your signal uh, in a much clearer way. If you just define your channel in this manner and define your waveform in 2D, you get comprehensive understanding of how the channel affects your waveform. This, is, this was the inspiration. This was the starting point. The starting point, two things. The channel was already represented in a compact form using delay Doppler spread. This representation, which is nicer than the previous representation that's used extensively in the literature. And you have fewer parameters to represent the channel here. And the parameters are meaningful. They represent physical uh, things like distance, speed. This uh, you, can, you can say something about the environment just by looking at the distance at, at the channel. And the other thing, so we said the, the motivation of the waveform, one is the representation of the channel in, two, in 3D diamond, in 3D uh, visualization, and also the representation theory, two inspiration of this work. So now let's go to the waveform and see how, it, how should you define it. So the waveform, you define it in a, now in 2D. Not 1D, 2D, similar to the channel. And you just determine a box here of certain V and certain tau. Tau is the delay period and V is the Doppler period. And these they have it it behaves like it, it has the Cousy periodicity feature in it and as you can see it has exponential basis function basically these are sine and cosine yes you know already ahead of time e to bar j 2 pi v t b or a to e to minus j they are sine and cosine but uh, phase and the quadrature and this 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 signal is the basically the waveform where at different times the signal Rotate, the signal rotates kind of in the delay Doppler domain based on the Cousy periodicity of the signal. So think of it like sine or cosine, but this is in 3D, 3D, where it has 3D, 3D shape and it it just keeps repeating itself through. It takes all the directions. So now what did we have? We have a new kind of waveforms that are defined in 2D and they have the Cousy periodicity feature and they have relationship with cosine, sine and the exponential basis function but not one, two of them and these are orthogonal with each other. Now how do we transfer from this domain to the time domain, from this domain to the frequency domain. As you know, yes, you t I understand that now we represented the waveform in 2D similar to the channel. But at the time when I want to transmit my signal, there is no 2D in transmission. I have only time when I want to transmit by. I have time. You want to you have to transmit it from one and from antennas. From like how do you transmit? You transmit time. So to do that, you transfer, you, you use Zach transform, new transform, call, we call it Zach transform. 
that takes whatever you define in delay Doppler, whatever the box, the matrix, the two dimension shape, you and transform it to one dimension along alongside time. This one dimension alongside time is basically this two dimension in the delay Doppler. So if you want to transmit your signal, you just use that transform which integrates alongside doubler v to get the signal alongside t alongside time if you want to have it in frequency you integrate this you basically integrate this signal alongside tau to get what the signal alongside frequency so what did we have now now as you can see, you can move from frequency to time via Fourier transform, Fourier transform forward and backward, reverse. You can move from here to here by a Zach transform along tau and here to here, Zach transform along V. And also from time to here, you can go back by the inverse of Zach transform here along V. So basically it's something in you new mapping, new transformation that we never saw before unless you are a mathematician working in math because they already know this Zach transform and they already know that there are there are things here different di new dimensions that are different time than time and the frequency but they don't have examples for them in practical life the communication here is the example where you define your waveform. It's like saying in math, in linear algebra, in linear algebra, we know that you can have, you can derive and have large number of orthogonal basis function having same time frequency and this. But our, our visualization capability only can imagine three dimension or four. Uh, you have the x, y, z, and time axis. You, uh, other than this, you do, think of the fifth dimension, sixth dimension, seventh dimension. You're stuck. You don't know. You don't have examples. What about ten, tenth dimension? What about eleventh? You don't. The same here. So this transform operation is already known in math. Not new. For the ones in math, it's very trivial thing. But the application of it to see something physical that represents this and reflects this phenomenon is really astonishing and making lots of sense to us. Because only when you find an application to the math, the math becomes valuable and useful. So now you have this, let's put them on, the, on a triangle. This we call it the general framework of signal processing, the transformer process. If I give you a signal in time and tell you find in frequency, find the signal in frequency, you have two options. Either you go alongside this path, this path, you tell me I can go this way. Basically, I take if, to go from time to frequency, I, I, what do I take? Fourier transform, yes, and or I go this path from here to here. Let's make it easier. Frequency to time, you have Fourier transform. This basically, it should be time to frequency, Fourier transform. Frequency to time, inverse Fourier transform. Now, let's say to go from here to here, you use FT. Also, you can go from here to here by this path. You basically take the Zach transform along the frequency Zach transform inverse because you are going against the arrow. You take the inverse and you multiply it by the Zach transform, the time Zach transform. And this is equal to the Fourier transform. Imagine, then now you have a new way, new method of calculating your Fourier transform that you were not aware of before. Fourier transform is not only this method, 
but you can find it via Zach transforms as well. And the same, if you are here and want to move here, you have this, you can inverse Zach transform, and here inverse Fourier transform with inverse Zach transform along frequency, you get the same answer. This is the relationship between the three domains, time, frequency, delay Doppler. So have you imagined that there is another dimension in the signal and system uh, domain different than time and the frequency in your in the courses related to signal and system have you ever heard or talked about something different than time and the frequency that's related to time and the frequency i think no now from now on you you're you now learned that there is a new domain called delay doppler that's that can be related and interconnected with time and the frequency via series set of Fourier transforms and Zach transforms. And this is something really new in the field of communication. We are not used to it. So here we are. This is your OTFS signal in 2D plane and going out of the port, you have the delay period, the Doppler period, and you can, it has a relationship with the, with the TDM waveform via Zach transform. It has a relationship with the FDM waveform via uh, frequency Zach transform. And it represents the connection between the general theory and communication. And here, this is the pulse in delay Doppler domain, yes? When you go to the time domain by using the Zach transform, the pulse shape becomes something like this, yes? So if you are in MATLAB and you don't see this, you, don't, you see something like this. This basically is exactly equal to this, but you need to get its transform. Because sometimes you don't see the shape of the signal or the actual behavior of the signal unless you go to the other domain and to go to the other domain you need to use proper transform function that can allow you to see the signal in the in the in a different window from a different view we call this signal in the time domain after the exact transform a long time t a time shifted phase modulated pulse train this is what you basically transmit as an ideal waveform that's robust against the channel imperfect imperfections. So now how does this waveform interact with the channel? Yes. So assume assume here that we we said this is uh, OFDM along if we have OFDM and here we have TDM. We have one transmitter tower and we have three, four objects. And all these four objects are reflectors. So basically when your signal hits here, it gets reflected out of it. And due to the distance, we, we receive the signal after after certain period. And due to having uh, for this tall building, the distance is larger, and that's why you receive the signal after longer period of time. And for the car, this you receive it after longer period of time because it's really farther and it causes Doppler. But look at this, look at this one, look at this pulse here that corresponds to two reflectors. This one, because both they have the same distance they kind of, they have the same distance from the horizontal distance, I mean, from the tower. And therefore, they come exactly at the same time. And since they are coming exactly at the same time, I told you the signals can combine coherently or incoherently. So this pulse will play tricks on us. It will keep going, changing up and down, down and up based on the, based on these uh, reflectors because this is where well, this has a speed different than this the speed of this zero the speed of this is not zero 
and therefore they are uh, superimposing on top of each other and it will cause severe fading here. The same when you go to frequency domain. For frequency domain, this will come at a different frequency because it has a different speed and this is at a different frequency because it has different speed. But these two, they have same frequency, they have the same speed, yes, zero speed. But they have different distance, so it will cause severe fading over this. So as you can see, whether you go time division or frequency, you cannot separate the pulses in any of these domains very well. Yes, to separate them very well, you need something similar to the channel. The channel separates delay and delay and doubler. So why don't we have a waveform that can separate delay and doubler? Define the information in delay and doubler so that each reflection just becomes independent of the other, does not get does not get superimposed with the other reflections, and therefore you can detect it easier. And this is what the waveform called OTFS do. Look at here, you transmit your waveform and you receive it. Since you are in the delay doubler domain, you get five different signals for each reflector. Each reflector, you get an independent signal in the delay doubler domain. And each one is exactly in a location representing how far the object from the receiver and how far, how, what's the based on the distance and the speed of the object, you get the waveform in your delay Doppler domain. While in T, in TDM, two, two signals will be combined to one, and here three signals will get combined to one. So there is something hidden here. There is something hidden here. I can only see it on if I define my waveform to be in the 2D domain which is possible by using OTFS and in this case we call the waveform invariant doesn't change separable you can easily separate it and they are orthogonal and this is something very very desirable in wireless communication because it simplifies now the processing the reception process and make it very easy. Now this is this is this is the diagram that shows that the industry up until now the industry yes up until now we were using either this 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 edge this edge or this edge. This basically this figure shows the relation between delay and doubler. When the doubler goes to infinity, uh, this edge represents the frequency representation of the signal, which is O of dm, think of it. And when tau goes to infinity, you, you, you just, the, the approximation goes to time to representation, which is tdm. So we are, most of the designs that have been proposed and used up until now in the literature are addressing the edge, the extreme cases. We have never been designing waveforms that are optimal to different cases like this. When the delay this, doubler this. When the delay, we call it the delay doubler box, the delay doubler box. See how many cases are left unaddressed, untouched. You don't have designs in current wireless system that are optimized to these cases. And if you were to optimize, it's really, it would be very difficult with TDM and OFDM to optimize for all these cases. But with OFDM, OTDF, OTFM, uh, OTFS, it just general a general waveform that can cover any use case with any doubler, without, with any doubler delay box it fits for all these use cases which is something amazing that we never thought of it before because we we were just like up until now we are focusing here in the OFDM even the 5G now the standard is gonna be using OFDM
Now, to, to handle doubler, what do we do? To handle doubler, we design complex receivers. But we could have simplified this further if we adopt a technology that can inherently be robust to doubler. But, you know, it's not always easy to push something new to the standardization process, as I told you before. It has, like... Um, some other consideration in the account like economy and big companies and this and that so sometimes we miss good things and consider some other things that are not the right way to do but because of other economical and cost issue related things so this is the thing that i want you to get during this lesson related to OTFS to get the concept of it the, the main points related to it how is the, its connection with the math its connection with the delay doubler representation its connection with the time domain frequency domain how it stands as a different domain its relationship with the ZAC transforms and the other points that we discussed here and there so we can stop here you don't have any questions and we can continue after let's say five ten minutes from now thank you very much for your attentions and meet you in five minutes from now